Okay, welcome. Uh, this is Kevin Kanan from the Newark Museum of Art. Uh, we are welcoming you to our Ask an Astronomer program, yet another edition of our program today. And uh, before we get started, just want to mention that uh, we have some upcoming programs on Saturday. Uh, this coming Saturday, we have a roundtable happening, a uh, roundtable about urban farming. Uh, that's going to be hosted by Catherine Evans, our Deputy Director for Collections. And that's going to be on Saturday at 3 p.m. And so uh, you can go out to our website and register for that. Uh, but uh, we're going to get started with our Ask an Astronomer program. And so we hope you have lots of questions for us and our special guest. We have a very special guest with us today. Uh, we have uh, Galileo, uh, one of the uh, most famous and one of my favorite astronomers. Uh, and uh, so we're going to be uh, doing a little time travel today. We're going to go back to the year 1612. And uh, we're going to speak to uh, Galileo about his amazing discoveries. Uh, he's been using a very interesting new instrument uh, to look at the night skies. And he's been doing that for a couple of years now. And he's going to report back to us uh, some of the amazing discoveries that he has made. And so, uh, Professor, if you'd like to uh, get started here. Uh, piacere, piacere di conoscervi. Oh, mi scusi, mi scusi, uh, professore. Uh, uh, my Italian is a little rusty, and maybe some of our audience also is a little rusty. So, if you could continue uh, in English, that would be great. For you, I'll speak English. Well, it is a pleasure to meet you. My name is Galileo Galilei. I'm a professor of mathematics and philosophy for Grand Duke Cosimo de Medici, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. And I've come here today to speak to a group of esteemed scientists about some of my most recent discoveries. You are esteemed scientists? Well, we'll find out. Um, does anyone know something Galileo is known for? Are you, are you able to answer that question? Well, apparently <laughs> you can't answer that question, but that's all right. Well, uh, I, I will, uh, well, let me just begin my story at the beginning. And a couple of years ago, I was doing my most favorite of all things to do. Now, some people think my most favorite thing to do is scientific experiments. I love scientific experiments, but it's not my most favorite thing to do. And then other people think, oh, looking at the stars. Every evening, I'll go out for several hours and look up into the heavens. But it's not my most favorite thing to do. My most favorite thing to do is eat. And I was having a very nice dinner party with my friend Frau Sapi. We had cooked chicken. You don't care, we cooked the chicken. Anyway, at this dinner party, Sapi told me about a letter he had gotten from one of uh, my old students, Jacques Badaviri. Jacques living in France now. We won't hold that against him. But in this letter, Jacques told Sapi of a most wonderful toy he had seen at a party himself. And they called this toy the spyglass. And people would look through this toy. And when they looked through this tube, what they looked at appeared to move three times closer it appeared to become three times wider and nine times larger in area. Sapi said, oh, I would love to have one of those toys. I said, all right, I'll make you one. He said, you've never even seen one of these. How are you going to make me one? I said, I'm a scientist. I'll make you one. And I went back to my laboratory and I thought, now they called this toy the spyglass. What would you expect to find inside something called a spyglass? Glass. Now, of course, there's the glass like you might find in a window. If I put a piece of window glass into each end of a tube and look through it, what I look at will appear exactly the same. What other kind of glass might we use? The magnifying glass, the spectacle glass. The, do you know what they call those little pieces of glass, the magnifying glass, the spectacle glass? They call them lenses. Do you know where the word lens comes from? What's my favorite thing to do? Eat. Have you ever had the lentil soup? <laughs> it's very good, yes? And in the soup, there are little beans. And if you look at them one way, they are round. If you look at them the other way, they look just like a little lens. Lentil, lens, where is where the word comes from. And I actually had several of these in my laboratory. Now, there are two kinds of lens. There are the convex lens, which are very fat in the middle and very skinny by the edge. And there are the concave lens, which are very skinny in the middle and very fat by the edge. And I had several of these and I tried several different combinations and I found one combination. If I were to look through the tube now, what I look at appears to move three times closer. 
It appears to be three times wider and nine times larger in area. On the very first evening, after hearing about this wonderful toy called the spyglass, I had made my own very first spyglass, but it was just a toy. And I thought I could improve upon this. At the time I was teaching at the University of Padua, Padua was part of the Venetian state, you know, Venice with the canals, the gondola, but one of the things Venice is most famous for is its glassmakers. So I went down to the glassmakers and I said, Signore, you must give me some of your very best lenses. They said, Signore Galileo, for you, of course. They gave me a nice collection of lenses. I went back to my laboratory and I tried many different combinations and I found one combination. If I look through the tube now, what I appear to look at will seem to move eight times closer it will be eight times wider and 64 times larger in area. Well, now I had a very good spyglass. As I say, I was teaching at the University of Padua, Padua being part of the Venetian state. I knew the Doge of Venice would love to have a spyglass. Well, Venice is right on the ocean. Sometimes there are pirates. They come, they attack Venice. The Doge can send someone down to defend the city, or there might be emissaries coming from another country, and he can send someone down to greet them. Or there might be ships coming from the east or the New World bringing wonderful treasures, and the Doge can send someone down a tax collector, so he gets his share first. So I know the Doge would love to have a spyglass. So I took the Doge and all of the senators down to the Campanile, the, um, the bell tower. And I get the Doge out to the top of the tower. And I said, Doge, look out there. Do you see any ships out there today? And the Doge says, no, there's no ships out there today. I looked through the spyglass. I said, Doge, there is a ship out there. It will be here in two hours. The Doge says, no. There's no ships out there today. I tell the Doge to look through the spyglass. He takes the spyglass. I don't know what I was thinking. The very first spyglass I made using a piece of lead pipe. Have you ever held the lead? It's very heavy. I almost knocked the Doge right off the top of the bell tower. They don't like it when you knock the Doge off the top of the bell tower. So I prop the Doge up nice and secure and the Doge looks through the spyglass. He says, yes. There's a ship out there. Well, of course, all of the senators did not have the spyglass. So they're all going, oh, the Doge is seeing things, but he pays no attention to them. And he starts looking around with the spyglass. He looks down at the farmers in the market. Oh, very nice vegetables. He looks at the fishermen. Oh, very nice fish. He looks in a window. Shouldn't have done that. One hour later, there's a tiny dot on the horizon. The Doge looks at the dot with the spyglass. He says, I believe that's Massimo's ship. When all of the senators going, oh, the Doge is seeing people on the water. His mind is gone completely. But what sailed into the harbor of Venice one hour later? Massimo ship. Well, the Doge was very impressed with this. He gave me a big raise. I had only been making 350 florin a year. Hardly enough to survive as a professor of mathematics and philosophy. But he gave me a raise to 1,000 florin a year, my position for life. I, of course, gave the Doge the spyglass. And I went back to my laboratory and I thought, well, this is very good. Now I have a nice salary, my position for life, but I don't have a spyglass. Well, I have to make another spyglass, but I'd used all of the lenses the glassmakers had given me. So I went back to the glassmakers and I said, Signore, you must give me some of your very, very best lenses. They said, Signore Galileo, we gave you all of the lenses we have. I said, well, then you must teach me to make the glass. And they taught me to grind the glass and they taught me to polish the glass. And now, now I have a spy glass. If I were to look through this spy glass now, what I look at appears to move 20 times closer. It appears to be 20 times wider and 400 times larger in area. Well, now I had a very good spyglass. As I say, I was teaching at the University of Padua, and I thought, what should I look at? From the time I was a young boy, studying with the brothers of Ambrosia, I had learned the way the universe works. According to Aristotle, one of the great thinkers of all times, at the center of all things is the earth, and around the earth moves the moon. And beyond the moon is Mercury going around the earth and Venus going around the earth and the sun and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. And beyond all of these wandering stars are the fixed stars all going around the earth. And because these objects are in the heavens, well, Aristotle, the great thinker, 
said, well, they must be the most perfect of all objects. Because well, what else could you find in the heavens except for the most perfect of all objects? And I thought, well, this is very good. I'll turn my spyglass to the heavens and I shall see the most perfect of all objects as no one has ever seen them before. And this is where I've come to answer question, your questions about today. By the way, I don't call this the spyglass anymore. About a year ago, I was down in Rome at Chezzy's. They made me a member of the Lynchian Academy. And there was a Greek poet there, uh, Dimissiani. And he said, spyglass doesn't sound very good doesn't sound very good. He says, why don't you use the Greek and call it the telescope? So now to see afar. So now I call this my telescope and I decided to turn my telescope to the heavens and you wouldn't, you can't imagine the wonderful things I've been able to see, but I'm going to let you ask me all about them. So, uh, Signora Kevin, are you still there? Oh yes, I'm here. Very good. Yes, if you have uh, questions for, for uh, Professor Galileo, uh, you can use the, uh, the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you're on uh, Facebook watching, you can use the comment box uh, there to ask a question. Uh, we have uh, one question uh, about your children. Do you have children? And did you teach them to use the spyglass? Oh, well, yes, of course. I have, I have a daughter, Virginia. She's 12 years old. I have another daughter, Livia. She's 10 years old. And then I have my little son, Vincenzo. He's only six years old. I named my daughters after my sisters. I named my brother after my father because I wasn't going to name him after my brother, uh, my son after my father, because I wasn't going to name him after my brother. Uh, but yes, I and I have uh, been teaching Virginia, especially Virginia is a very, very bright girl. She does. She helps me with my mathematics. She helps me with my experiments. Uh, so we have uh, they, they're they're quite nice. And the girls are actually living with me now. The brother, my son is still living with his mother uh, in, in Padua. Uh, his mother did not want to come to Firenze because, uh, well, she she met my mother a few years ago and she didn't think it would be a very good situation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a question from Elsa. Uh, did you uh, pick Santa Croce for your final resting place or did someone else pick that? My final, I'm not dead. <laughs> I hope Elsa is not a doctor. <laughs> because if she were so. a doctor, she would know you can't ask someone where they're going to pick their resting place when they're dead because they're not dead. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it would be very nice if I could. Uh, the cathedral, the, uh, where the, there, are, there are many places that would be nice. It would be nice to be in the Domo in the cathedral, but uh, one has to have a little bit more influence than I have to be able to be buried there, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, we had another question uh, about uh, how do you combine lenses in your telescope? It's, it's actually quite simple. There are two lenses. There is a convex lens at the front and the convex lens acts to collect light. If you've ever had a magnifying glass and you take it outside on a bright sunny day, if you hold the lens just right, you will see that the light all focuses down to a little point and that little point it's, it's impossible to see anything in that little point, but that is all the light from the sun that, that is going through that first lens. Then at the other end of the tube, I put a concave lens, which acts like a magnifying glass to enlarge that little dot until it's big enough so you get to see details of all the things. Now, don't ever look at the sun with a telescope. I'm just talking about uh, using the magnifying glass to make the little dot. Don't look at the oil. Oh, I tried to do that one time. I had spots in my eyes for months. But uh, you can actually look at the sun with a telescope. Did you know that? What you do, if you hold the telescope in just the right way, if I hold it and I let the, the light project through the telescope, it will project out through the back lens and it will put a nice image of the sun right onto a wall or a piece of paper. And it's some very interesting things I've discovered about the sun. Did you know that the sun is actually a gigantic burning ball? 
I don't know what's burning, but it's a gigantic burning ball. And all over this ball, there are blemishes, little spots. Now, I don't think they're actually very little. I think they are actually quite big. And those spots seem to migrate around the sun. It, it, they go all the way around once about a month, which tells me perhaps Aristotle was wrong one other time. Perhaps the sun is rotating. And as the sun rotates, it carries these little spots. I think they might be storms right around the sun with it. Amazing. Uh, actually, speaking of the sun, uh, Elsa also asked another question about, uh, have you ever seen a, an eclipse? Oh, yes, yes. I've seen many eclipses. It's, it's one of the things you, as, a, as an astronomer, you have to learn to be able to predict when eclipses are going to happen. And uh, eclipses are very important to astronomers. They were one of the things that made it possible for astronomers to understand that the Earth was actually round. Because if you watch an a, a eclipse of the moon, there's a, a round object that passes right in front of the moon. Well, what could that round object be? but the earth. So eclipses are very important. I've seen many of them. Uh, it's hard to look at an eclipse. Uh, if, if, if you're looking right at a solar eclipse, when the sun disappears, it, it can be a little bit of a problem because there's so much light, you'll get those spots in front of your eyes once again. But if you will look at the lunar eclipse, it's not hard to look at those at all. Uh, and with a telescope, you can actually see the shadow as it moves right across the moon. It's actually quite Fun. It is quite, quite amazing. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, Mary had a question uh, about uh, the moon. Uh, what did you see when you trained your telescope on the moon? It's very interesting. The moon, Aristotle told us it must be a perfectly smooth object. Well, when I looked at the moon, what you see, uh, you, you've heard of the Terminator, that line that separates the bright side of the moon from the dark side of the moon. Well, if the moon were perfectly smooth, when you look at that Terminator, you should see a nice smooth line. But that line is not smooth. It's wiggly and jiggly and bumpy. And on the bright side of that line, there are all these little dark spots. And on the dark side, there are all these little bright white spots. Well, the moon must not be perfectly smooth. Now you would say, well, what could be up there? I think there are mountains, craters, hills, valleys, all over the surface of the moon. Now you might say, well, then why is the edge of the moon nice and smooth? I have an idea about how that could be. If you hold your hand up in front of you, just like this, so your fingers are all stretched out, imagine that here you have a mountain, here you have a little valley, here you have a mountain, here you have a valley, another mountain, another valley, a big valley right here. Maybe that's even a crater, I don't know. But now take your other hand and put it so that your fingers almost interlock. Now you'll notice the valleys have gotten much smaller the mountains are all blending together. It's starting to get smooth. If you have many mountains and valleys and many hills and craters all lining up with each other, after a while, you would see a nice, smooth outer edge of the moon. But if you look directly up down on the moon, you would see the mountains and valleys and hills and craters all over the place. So I have discovered that the moon is very much like the Earth, and Aristotle was wrong once again. Well, speaking of which, uh, someone asked about uh, your discoveries. Uh, have any of them uh, provoked any controversy? Oh, many times. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times. There was one discovery I made years ago. I, was, I, I used to teach at the University of Pisa. Uh, and I had observed that Aristotle was wrong about many things. Now, I don't usually like to talk about this particular little demonstration I made. It cost me my position as professore, but uh, for you, I will. And Aristotle said that all objects fall according to their weight. If you have a heavy object, it will fall quickly. If you have a light object, it will fall slowly. I thought this doesn't make sense. Have you ever seen a hailstorm when the ice falls from the sky? According to Aristotle, at the beginning of the storm, you just have the big chunks of ice, but they're a medium and small. According to Aristotle, in the middle of the storm, you just have the medium chunks of ice, but they're a big and small. 
And according to Aristotle, at the end of the storm, you just have little tiny chunks of ice, but they are still big and medium. They all fall from the same clouds. They must all fall the same way. So I decided to show my friends, the philosophers, that Aristotle was wrong. And I took them down to the tower at Pisa. They didn't do a good job when they built the tower. Have you seen the tower at Pisa? It leans over like this. There are a couple of theories about why the tower leans over. This first theory is probably correct, although I don't like this theory. And that is, the, the, when Pisa was built by the Medici, they just filled in an old swamp with dirt and they built the town right on top of it. Well, when they built the tower, they built it on a muddy foundation and it started to lean over. That's probably correct, but I have a different theory. My theory is the architect, the gentleman who designed the building, he had a very bad back and he always walked like this. Well, when he looked at the tower, it was nice and straight. You like that theory? I can see you. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> so anyway, I, I took all my friends and philosophers and my students down to the Tower of Pisa. And I, I had two balls made to look exactly alike. One was made of metal and the other one was made of wood, but they couldn't tell which was which. I said, which of these balls will hit the ground first? And all the professors said, well, the metal ball, Aristotle has told us, will hit the ground first. I said, let's find out. And I had one of my students help me. Well, the tower, it's 50 cubits high. You have to climb to the top of that tower. There's no fence. It's very easy to fall out of a tower. If I fell out of that tower, I'd feel terrible. If my student fell out, I wouldn't feel quite so bad. So I had him climb to the top of the tower. He drops the balls. They hit the ground almost exactly at the same time. Where all of the professors are going, oh, he's a magician. He's trying to trick us. He's trying to discredit Aristotle. I lost my position teaching at the University of Pisa just because I demonstrated to them that Aristotle was wrong. And now you ask me if I've ever gotten into con conflicts because of my thoughts and my discoveries. Yes, I've gotten into a lot of them. And that's just one. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Well, uh, uh, we have another question uh, about your telescope. Uh, you know, it's got a, a really long tube on it. Uh, did you try different two materials? Tubes. Two tubes. Two tubes. Uh, uh, what are they made of? And did you try different materials? Uh, it, well, the very first one, as I mentioned before, I made from a piece of lead pipe. Uh, and lead is very heavy. I almost knocked the doge right off the tower because he was holding on and he started going down. But then we started to make them from a wooden, uh, a piece of wood, which one of my uh, artisans carved out to make a, a trough. It would look a little bit like a C, a letter C. And then you take another one, you put them together. And now you have a tube. Well, that's a lot of work. And one of my artisans said, you know, we have a tool for cutting slivers of wood. And they would drag it along and they would have a long, sliver of wood and they so they're very long but very thin and very narrow and when you put them all together you can bind them together and it makes a nice tube well i actually have two tubes in mine i can show you right there and this tube holds the lens that you look through and this tube holds the lens that is closest to the object you're observing. And by moving these back and forth, you can actually focus the lenses until you have a perfect vision of what you're looking at. Nice. Uh, we had another question about your telescope. Uh, did you uh, keep how you make the telescopes a secret? I, I don't really keep it a secret. It's hard to keep it a secret. But what I'm not telling people is how to make the lenses. Uh, now, the right. glass makers taught me how to make good lenses, but it turned out I could actually, I found ways to make even better lenses than they did. And it's all in the process of grinding. Now, when you grind a lens, the glass makers just give me these little pieces of glass and they're round, but they're not they're flat on one side. By, by grinding them with very special stones, you can get it to be just the right shape. And this takes a lot of practice and trial and error. But of course, once you're done grinding on a stone, uh, grinding on glass with a stone, it, it looks like milk. You can't see through it at all. Then you take another stone called the pomace. You'll find this near a volcano. And you mix that with a little oil or a little water and you start to polish and you can polish all. 
stretches out until the glass is perfectly clear. Well, I don't, I don't tell people how I've learned to do that. It takes a great deal of practice and a couple of little uh, secrets, let's put it that way. Uh, but uh, otherwise, other than that, the tubes, anyone can take them apart. I know my friend Kepler up in the German country, he's been trying to make one and the Germans don't make very good spectacles. He hasn't been able to make a very good one at all. Now they can make the toys like they did. Uh, the, the first one was actually probably made by a gentleman named Hans Lippershey in the Dutch country. And he was a spectacle maker. He made the, the spectacles for your eyes. And those are not that hard to make, but the tricky part on my telescope is making that concave lens in the back, which magnifies and makes it perfectly clear. Right, right, yeah. Uh, let's see, we have a couple other questions. Now, you did mention that um, you had some conflict with the professors at the university. Uh, did the church object to any of your research? Oh, I have a very good friend in the church. Uh, last summer, I was down in Rome and I had dinner and he has a very good cook with Pope Paul. And Pope Paul, I showed Pope Paul my telescope. I showed him the mountains and craters on the moon. I showed him the little moons going around Jupiter. I even showed him the little ears on Saturn. And Pope Paul told me, he loved what I was doing. And as long as he lives, I have a patron in the church. Now, there are many small minded priests who want to attack me and say that I'm a blasphemer. But as long as the Pope is alive and as long as he is my patron, I don't think I have to worry about that. Do you? Well, we'll see about that. Uh, did any of the priests uh, uh, object to your ideas about the, the solar system? Oh, yes, many of them did. Uh, lots of, one of the problems that they have is, first off, they've been, all been taught about Aristotle, and they learned Aristotle by what we call rote. They just heard what he said, and they were expected to believe it. Well, I don't exactly agree with that philosophy of teaching. I believe that it's best to find evidence to prove an idea is correct, perhaps by doing an experiment. Uh, but the priests don't do that. Also, they look into the Bible and they find f references that they say they interpret this way. And I ask them, well, how do you know your interpretation is correct? which of course is probably not the right thing to ask a priest, but uh, I've, I've asked them that. And they just say, well, because it's what I always learned. And I, I say, well, perhaps you need to learn something else. Uh, I just try not to get into too many discussions with them. It could be a big, but Sarpy. Oh, my friend Sarpy. He said, and he's, he's a cleric in the church. He said, don't trust Pope Paul. And I thought, well, this is not very good. Why shouldn't I trust Pope Paul? And Sarpi said, well, several years ago, there was an edict, a, 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 co a command placed by the church on Venice because Venice apparently wasn't sending the church enough contributions in Rome. And the Pope told all the priests in Venice, you will not serve mass. Well, Sarpi being in charge of the churches, or at least in control of most of the churches in Venice, he told the priest, that's all right, you don't have to serve mass, but you're going to jail if you don't. Well, they all served mass, and Pope Paul, he said, was not very happy about this. And Sarpi says, now I can't prove this is true, but Sarpi says that Pope Paul commissioned an assassin to come and try to kill him. Well, Sarpi was attacked one evening as he was crossing one of the bridges in Venice. He was stabbed, I think it was 13 times, once right through his mouth. But if you know Sarpi, he didn't let that stop him. And he says, don't trust Pope Paul. You can't trust him at all. But um, could a person with such a good cook be untrustworthy? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, we had another uh, really interesting question from Heather. Uh, she, I don't know what you would call these in, in Italy, but uh, we call them the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. Have you ever That's seen them? That's what I named them. Oh, you did? Yes, those I lights in the Northern that. sky. Yeah. 
and it's it's like veils of light that pass across the northern sky. I, I, I named them the Aurora Borealis. Oh, I didn't know that you came the, up with the, the, the wandering oh. light of the north. Right. Sure, sure. Yes. And she asked if you saw any colors. Yes. Now, it doesn't happen very often. I think living in Italy, I'm not quite far north enough because I've heard, now I'm not there, and these are only stories, but I've heard that the people in the north country, uh, where they uh, very close up, uh, very far up north from here, they see them all the time, especially in the winter. Now, what they are, I don't know. I've looked through my telescope hoping I could see something in the north, but all I see in the north with my telescope is the stars and a few amorphous little, uh, I, I don't even know what we can call them. They look a little bit like stars, but they don't seem to be stars. They seem to be clouds. Uh, now these, the Aurora Borealis could be clouds, except that they seem, uh, from what I've been told and from what I have seen the few times I've seen it, they, they, they change shape all the time. Now, clouds do change shape, but you don't see them doing it very quickly. It all happens very slowly. Uh, I don't, it's, very, it's a very interesting phenomena, and I wish I could give you a good explanation, but I'm afraid I can't. Right, right. Well, uh, someone had a question about the uh, the moons of Jupiter. Uh, what did you name them and what did you discover about them? Ah, well, it was very interesting. When I first started to look at Jupiter, I saw Jupiter, a very bright little dot in the sky. But surrounding Jupiter, there were three more dots. There was one, two, three little dots, one, two on one side and one on the other. Now, Jupiter is what we call a wandering star. What this means is if you imagine you go out at night and let's imagine I'm Jupiter and you imagine there are stars behind me. On one night, if I'm Jupiter, there might be a star right, be, right, by, right next to my head. But the next night, because Jupiter is a wandering star, Jupiter will have moved and it might be a little further away from my head. Hit my head. You go out the next night, it'll be a little further away still. But every once in a while, Jupiter changes its mind and it goes the other way. So the next night it's back in front of one of those stars and the next night it's back in front of another. Well, this has caused the philosophers a great deal of difficulty. How do the wandering stars move against all of those fixed stars? And they came up with an idea. They said, well, the wandering stars are actually embedded in crystalline spheres. Now, years ago, they had said the moon is completely surrounded by crystalline spheres. I don't think that's true. But now they want crystalline spheres going around up in the sky. And they said the crystalline spheres look like this. Well, when I started to look at Jupiter, I found a Jupiter very bright in the sky with two little dots on one side and one dot on the other. And I thought, well, this is very good. I knew Jupiter was going this way through the sky. I thought I could go out the next night and I would see Jupiter. And I didn't see the two little dots on one side and one on the other. I saw three dots on the same side. I thought, this is very strange. There's something going on. I thought, I have to go out again the next night. And you know what I saw the next night? What's that? I didn't see anything. It was raining. <laughs> but I waited one more night, and the next night I saw two dots on one side and no other dot. Well, there's something strange going on with those dots. And then I thought, well, what if they are moons and they're going around Jupiter? So I named them the moons of Jupiter. I named them Cosmos moons, Cosmo one, Cosmo two, Cosmo three, Cosmo four. And actually I just named them Cosmos moons in my book, Sidereus Nuncius, the starry message. And when I told, Co I thought if I named them after Cosmo, he might give me a nice uh, position or maybe send some kind of a wonderful gift. And when I told him I had done that, he said, don't do that. And I said, why? He said, if I named the moons of Jupiter after him, his brothers would be jealous because they wouldn't have any moons. So I had to go back and into every copy of my book, I had to paste a little piece of paper where it said Cosmos stars. I called them stars then. And I had to write down Medici stars. So I called them Medici one, Medici two, Medici three, Medici four. Well, I, uh, I hope I don't... Uh violating the rules here, but I just want to let you know that uh, today in, in English, we call them Galilean moons after you. 
Isn't that nice? It is very nice. <laughs> you know, I was going to try. I, I figured when I couldn't find the, the when I couldn't name the four moons after Cosimo, I thought what I might be able to do is with my telescope, I could find a new planet, a new wandering star, and I could name that after Cosimo. But if they want to name those moons after me, it's very nice of them to do that. <laughs> Well, speaking of moons, we had uh, two very similar questions uh, about the moon uh, from Elsa and uh, uh, Grisili. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, basically, both of them asked the same thing. Do you think that humans would be able to visit the moon someday, uh, you know, travel outside of the Earth's atmosphere? And could that happen? Yes, I'm sure. Now, to get to the moon, now the moon, if Aristotle, if mathematicians are right, uh, is about oh, 250,000 miles away. That's a long way. It takes me almost a month just to get to Rome. To get to the moon, it would take me uh, centuries to get to the moon. Now, that's if we could build a ladder that would go all the way there. Um, I don't think that that doesn't seem very likely. Uh, I hope that the young ladies are not uh, uh, planning on um, seeing this happen very soon, if ever. <laughs> if I remember correctly, one of your colleagues, Kepler, wrote a little bit about traveling out into oh. space. <laughs> Kepler. Kepler has sent me a letter recently, and he's figured out why all the circles are on the moon. Do you know why the circles are on the moon, according to Kepler? How's that? Uh, that's so all the farmers on the moon can plant their fields in circles. They get equal amounts of light. Oh, hmm. that's interesting. <laughs> he has many strange ideas. Right, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, another question uh, about uh, telescopes. Uh, how long did it take you to make uh, a telescope? Well, the very first- Or making the lenses too, I guess. Well, yeah. the very first telescope, since I had lenses in my laboratory, it took mm -hmm. me about three hours to make that one that was three times. Wow. It was just a toy. Uh, the glass that I needed to make for the eight times, the one that I gave the doge, and actually it's interesting, while I was making the one for the doge, one of the salesmen for Hans Lippershey, the gentleman from the Dutch country, had right. come to Venice to try to sell the doge one of his toys, his three times spyglass. And unfortunately for him, he ran into my friend Sarpi and Sarpi said, oh, the doge would love to see that. Why don't you sit right there? I'll go get the doge. But of course, Sarpi knew I was building a better one. So he didn't let the poor gentleman see the doge and by the time he got to show the doge his little three times telescope i had already given the doge the eight times and the doge says well that's very interesting look at this oh, he couldn't sell him anything but that one took me almost a week now it can take me anywhere from well it took me almost from August until December before I had a good one that multiplied 20 times. Now uh, I'm trying to do it one 30 times and it's been almost two years and I still have not succeeded in making a 30 times telescope. So it can take two or three months. The grinding of the glass is very slow. If I break a lens, I have to start over and each lens has to be exactly part of a pair. Now they're not identical, but they have to work together. And many times it can take lots and lots of trials before I manage to get them to work together. But I would say on average, it probably takes me about six to eight weeks to make a telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm finished with the telescopes, what I do is if it's, a, if it's better than the last one that I made, I will decorate the old one. I'll put leather on it. I will put gold embossing on there. Uh, and then I might give it away. I might give it to, oh, uh, well, I gave one to the Doge. I gave one to uh, the Grand Duke. I gave one to Christopher Clavius, the, the mathematician for Pope Paul. I gave one to the King of Spain. I gave one to the emperor in Germany. Now the emperor doesn't know anything about the stars. So he will look at the trees and the birds or whatever he can see, but then he'll send his, his telescope over to Kepler. He'll say, Kepler, tell me, is this Italian telling us the truth? 
is are those stars out in the sky there? And Kepler will go, yes, there are mountains and craters on the moon. There are, there are moons surrounding Jupiter. But before Kepler gets to make any discoveries of his own, the emperor will say, I want my telescope back. So <laughs> I will make it, I will give it to him. And if he wants to give me a nice present in return, well, it would be very impolite for me to refuse a present from an emperor, wouldn't it? Well, I think so. <laughs> uh, we have another question, uh, a related question. Uh, what other inventors uh, do you admire? I guess you also include scientists there too. Oh, yes. Well, Leonardo da Vinci. Right. One of the great, sure. most of his inventions didn't work, but he had some great ideas. And in fact, I was able to modify some of his ideas so that they did work. He had a, uh, a pump that used a screw to bring water up from the well. Unfortunately, that pump required two oxen all day long walking around to turn the screw to bring the water up. Well, you know what oxen do? They leave little presents on the ground, if you know what I mean. And I thought, well, what I could do is I could make a pendulum. Now, pendulum, you, if you push a pendulum, it will swing and swing and swing. And by having that pendulum turn gears, it could turn the screw. I made a pump that would pump water all day long just by a few pushes of the pendulum. Uh, but uh, Leonardo was very good. Archimedes was a, one of my... Uh, I. I, I I idolized Archimedes. Uh, he came up with an idea. Now, he, he used the buoyancy of an object to determine whether it was gold or silver or lead. I've even uh, used that concept to make a scale that you could actually tell what you were weighing because it was so accurate while it was weighing things floating in the water. Uh, oh, there must be, there's lots and lots of other inventors, but I would say those are my two favorite inventors. Great, great. Well, we're uh, almost out of time for our program today, but uh, we did have an interesting question from Bob. Uh, do you envision that additional Cosmica Sideria will be discovered? And he also goes about if you had a more powerful telescope, could you discover more moons around Jupiter? That's why I'm trying to work on a 30 times telescope. There's one problem with looking at the moons going around Jupiter, and that is my telescope only looks at one half of one degree, not even one full half of one degree, which means you're looking at a very small piece of the sky. Uh, I wish I could make a telescope that would look at a larger piece of the sky. Then I might be able to find uh, more uh, moons going around Jupiter. So far, I haven't found any evidence that there are more. But I will tell you, when I first started to look through the telescope with the three times telescope, I saw perhaps, I don't know, oh, 30,000 stars. Now with our eyes, I, I can see about 3,000 stars. With my 20 times telescope, I can see over a thousand times more stars, perhaps, uh, perhaps a, a hundred thousand stars. Well, if I could build a better telescope, there might be all kinds of stars that have not been discovered and I would be able to discover them. But I haven't been able to build a better telescope to do that yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> Okay, well, that's uh, about all the time we have for today. And so uh, thanks to the audience for all those uh, great questions. And uh, thank you to Professor Galileo for all, all his insight into his Vega. discoveries. Uh, really amazing stuff. Uh, for those of you who have been following along with our Ask the Astronomer programs, uh, we do have another one coming up uh, next month, uh, August 25th, again on Tuesday at about 12 noon. And uh, we'll uh, have some more, uh, another opportunity to ask an astronomer some more questions about the universe and things beyond Earth. And so thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Professor. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. <laughs>